This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. Chapter 16, Hunters 3. And our symbol is the Lion of Andor. Nynaeve's room was considerably larger than the novice rooms. She had a real bed, not one built into the wall. Two ladder back armchairs instead of a stool, and a wardrobe for her clothes. The furnishings were all plain, suitable for a middling successful farmer's house, but compared to the novices, the accepted live in luxury. There was even a small rug, woven with scrolls of yellow and red on blue. The room was not empty when Egwene and Nynaeve entered. Elaine stood in front of the fireplace, arms crossed beneath her breasts and eyes red at least partly from anger. Two tall young men sprawled in the the chairs, all arms and legs, one with his dark green coat undone to show a snowy shirt, shared Elaine's blue eyes and red-gold hair, and his grinning face marked him plainly as her brother. The other, Nynaeve's age and with his gray coat neatly buttoned, was slender and dark of hair and eye. He rose, all sure confidence, and lightly muscled grace, when Egwene and Nynaeve came in. He was, Egwene thought not for the first time, the most handsome man she had ever seen. His name was Galen. Taking things in order, the chapter header on Hunters 3 Clearly, they're going to recruit, is referring to recruiting Elaine to be the hunter for the Black Odd Jaw. What's the line about? Yeah. And of course, I guess you have Gollad and Gawain there too. So this is, this is all, all about the, a bunch of the house of, of Andor. I guess I highlighted eyes red at least partially from anger. I didn't know your eye. I've never heard the term eyes red from anger before. Well, at least partly from anger. I just figured it was because she just got beaten. <laughs> that's right, so what's actually happening here mostly from crying most and being likely. angry about being beaten but Fair also enough. being beaten is she the only one that's been beaten so far i think so and Gallad points it out it might be Gawain. i can't remember but one of them says something like and he won't tell us what's going on i can what i can tell though is that you've crossed shirium because you won't sit down and your eyes are red because you've been crying in your eyes and you won't sit down I think this chapter is notable because it is the transition of Egwene from crush on Galad to crush on Gawain. There's one paragraph. Yeah, it's a little lame because it's like literally because Elaine tells her to. I know, I know. <laughs> well, it's it. Elaine imparts the knowledge that Gawain also has a crush on her, which is not something she realized before. Right. So I guess that's the... The difference, but at the same time, it's still just like, really? You're just going to switch that over? And so the chapter starts off with her being like, the most handsome man she'd ever seen. It is good to see you again, he said, taking her hand. I've worried much over you. We have worried much. Her pulse quickened. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Me. I mean, we. That paragraph ends with light. If you even suspected what I was thinking, I'd die. What exactly do you think she's thinking there? She's thinking about wearing a sexy dress. Uh, seeing her in silk instead of plain white wool. Got it. Yeah. Or one of the Damani dresses. The transition from one to the other is so very teenager-like. That like, oh, this person likes me? Huh. Suddenly you're interested just because that person is interested in you? Well, yeah. I mean, they are teenagers. But also, I feel like I don't know how much better adults really are. Like, you find out that someone reasonably attractive is attracted to you as a single person. You have to kind of, like, turn and assess for a moment. Well, like, this is an option. What are the merits and what <laughs> drawbacks of potentially dating this person? I feel like that's a lot of how it goes. One person expresses the interests and the other person is like, not quite yes or no, but... Yeah, but I feel like we invest more in our crushes. Maybe. I don't know. Until until I'm dating someone for a while, I'm not invested. That's fair. I invest too much too soon in my relationships. Hmm. I yeah, I see you nodding. <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You're not going to protest. You date that a long. lot of people and then narrow it down. And when I say you, I mean me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just go on dates, see what happens. Uh-huh. Probably won't go well. I tend to be like, you want to go on a date? For the next three years? Great. <laughs> Let's do that. It is, we do have very different dating styles, which I think is funny. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that would have to happen is one of those would actually have to work out, and then it would have been a great decision. <laughs> they just they just didn't. 
Let's play in the odds. Some percentage of first relationships work out long term. It's a small percentage. So the boys followed Elaine into the room, and she's like, really, I don't want you to be here at all. And they're like, well, we're just concerned. And she was like, well, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this. Uh, I don't care. She doesn't care. No, she reiterates the I am not your sister bullshit. Yeah, all that. She's just snapping at both of them however she can. Right. I noticed this mention of Kulin Mm -hmm. as a warder, who is one of the warders that Gawain later kills. Oh, he's... Master of Arms. Yeah. One of the warders. Is he someone's warder? Yeah. I don't uh the notes don't say who, but he's he's the ma- he's the master of arms in Tarval and a warder. Just another mark in Gawain being a dick. Yes. Yeah. And that's not Hammer. Hammer is the man that trains the kind of warder recruits. And Coolin is a master of arms, which means he like marshals Tarvalon's troops. They're different. Warders aren't Tarvalon's troops. And Hammer is there to make Matt, to make them fight Matt. And to, talk, to, and to enforce the bet. I'm glad he's there to do so. Call them out on their shit. Yeah, and here Elaine calls them out on like, yeah, I'm sure you wanted to not stay here and train with the warders. I'm sure the reason you were fast talking was to help me. Gawain's like, well... <laughs> Yeah, referring to Morgase wanted to take them home too, but they talked their way out of it. Right. And part of that is they're they're referring to all the murders that happened with the Black Aja when the girls left as the reasons why they need to be there to protect them. Yeah. Well, he says the White Tower has become a dangerous place. There have been deaths, murders with no real explanations. And of course what he's referring to is the the people that Leandrin killed. Although he doesn't realize the women who left, the Aes Sedai who left, are the Black Aja. I don't think Gawain knows anything ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I yes. well, Really, though, I mean, at, at like any of the important facts. I did want to note that here Elaine lifts her chin and turns away from him. And I just want to point out that Elaine lifting her chin is why she always gets the veil stuck in her mouth. Yeah. In Tarabon. Tarabon, yeah. Tanchigo, thank you. She does that in response to, I think this is Gawain talking, saying, when it is safe for you to leave your training where to return you to Camelin. And Nynaeve offers one of the few helpful points so far in this conversation when she says, Morgase's commands carry no weight in Tarvalon, which is true. Yeah, but, you know, they're close allies. Just because her commands don't carry weight, her requests very much might. Her requests? Well, I mean, we know that they don't. I don't. <laughs> I'm not trying to be combative, but we already know that every everything that Morghese is asking for, she isn't going to get. But at the same time, the Aes that I are all like, "You're pissing. You're making a mistake. You're pissing off your mother. This is causing issues. Like, it's getting Elaine in trouble." So, in some way, her a will bit. is being felt, even if it's not getting the results that she wants. She's in Swan's hands now. True. Morghese's opinion isn't really important. The boys just don't know that. Well, it's not important in this place, in this situation. I suppose worth considering, but, you know, we already we already know. Swan already said that despite what Morghese wants, I'm keeping you. Right. Well, there's just levels to what Morghese wants. She's not getting Elaine back, but she might get the boys back. Oh, yeah. If she requested it. I, th- I think that if, if Morghese was like, yeah, I'm taking the boys back, and they didn't talk themselves out of it, I don't think Swan has any interest. Yeah, in that. Swan would have been like, "Yeah, sure, take them, no problem." Right? They're not the most one of the most powerful. I said I had to be born within a thousand years. Oh, I mean, Elaine's screwed. She's you know, like they said, like a dog between two towels. Like she is caught between her mother and the Amerlin. Like you know, and she's in trouble. Oh yeah. Well, she's going on that throne, and she's going to become I said I, whether she wants to or not. Yeah. It's just lucky for her that she wants both those things. I highlighted a couple lines down. Mother was half crazed with fear. I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that. Just that it looks like she wasn't under compulsion yet. Yeah. We don't think Ravine has anything to do with her behavior yet. Um, and right after that is when Gawain says, all I, all I know about is that you've run afoul of Shirium. And the only reasons I know that much are because you've been crying and you won't sit down. Nynaeve scolds them. Because her eyes are red and her butt hurts from getting spanked. Yeah. Swatted? Beaten? I don't know. That's another debate to have is like, 
How severe is the punishment in the White Tower? Are they actually beating these women? Are they spanking them? Like, seems like it's bruising. Well, I think there's a problem in your question. What's spanking? Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. And Shiryam's not using her hand. I don't think that ever we ever hear a mention of that. She's using straps and, like, planks. It begins with slippers. Yes, baby. <laughs> But that's that's like that's a thick leather strap is what a slipper is, right? Sure, a short one, but yeah, still, there's sticks, there's power, there's sometimes there's bleeding. Like these 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 escalate up into proper beatings. Sure, women have have to be healed so that they can be beaten again. Uh huh. I like Nynaeve's response to them calling out the fact that she's been hit because. You know, that's something that's really not, that's supposed to be kind of private. And the boy's calling it out in public, gets Nynaeve's back up. And she's like, I doubt you even asked permission to enter the accepted quarters. Which, of course, they don't need. <laughs> and she's not lying. They didn't ask it because they didn't need it. But they're, they don't know that. And so she uh, she's just very clever here. And then she does the, like, the mom countdown. One, two. You're not out of the door. But time Three. And they run. <laughs> yeah. Elaine clapped her hands delightedly. Oh, well done, she said. Very well done. I did not even know men were forbidden in the acceptance quarters, too. They aren't, Nynaeve said dryly. But those louts did not know it, either. Yeah, she's great. Reading through this chapter, it just caught me how smart Nynaeve was and how often she, like sees through the bullshit to the underlying truth of things. She's no little girl. She's a grown woman. She's no she's dummy had... either. There's a lot of grown women that are... Mm, and well, men yeah. Are dummies. She's had important responsibility and place in society in her life. She doesn't just buy whatever people shovel at, into her head. No, and she's also, you know, a little bit handicapped here because she's trying to obey the three O's and not lie. <laughs> I'd actually add the things to look out for if Nynaeve ever lies again. I mean, she almost never does. There's that one time where I think she lies to Egwene, and Egwene calls her on it and is, like, going to make her drink the really foul-tasting brew. And that's, like, where the balance of power shifts. In Teleranriad. Yeah. She, like, gives up her moral authority, and that's what lets Egwene get the upper hand for the first time and become the quote-unquote Amarillan seat. But it's also her real power. She can actually make Nynaeve drink it in that scene. She could. She could have, yeah, totally. She's the dreamer. Yeah, there's just a continuation of the power struggle between the two of these, where Nynaeve kind of starts on top, but Egwene ends up the authority figure, and they have they both have to go through that transition together. Yeah, that scene is important. That's It's cool to point that out. The rest of everyday life, Nynaeve is always stronger and more powerful. She's a more forceful person. She makes a bigger splash in the room. Everybody pays attention to what Nynaeve says when she gets mad. And she's literally more powerful, like in every way, other than... Other than in Teleron Riyadh. Right. But Nynaeve carries a big stick, as they say. <laughs> right. And But she doesn't talk softly. Really. No. <laughs> no. I noticed I did not say that. <laughs> did not add that to the quote. Yell and also carry a big stick. <laughs> <laughs> Threaten everybody. <laughs> with That's a the good big point, stick. Aradia. She did literally carry around the stick for a while. <laughs> That's how she dealt with people before she had the power. So Nynaeve offers to. She can't heal Elaine because that's. I think they've been ordered not to, but she could offer her like a salve to help the pain. She offers her a salve. Says that she's going to go heal Matt in a minute here, or she's going to try. When she offers that, I think when she sees the healing, she's like, I could only hold half that much power. And it's like six women plus an Sangreal. And it's like, dude, that's the first time it really puts me in, puts in perspective just how much more powerful Nynaeve is. Um, is during Matt's healing, when she's like, yeah, I could hold half that power. I'm not What? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's a lot of power. Is that a direct quote? And that, that's also, they're using Vorin Sa'angrial, which is like, which is the one that Egwene uses during the battle against the Shan Chan. And she only has a trickle of power when she's using it. So there's just 
level between where the Aes Sedai are and where Nynaeve is, and it's it's a significant jump. Yeah, nine or ten plus Vorin's Sangriol all, all melded together. But I can see that when you think about it with the variance between sisters, you know, some aren't really very powerful at all. And when we're talking about people like Nynaeve or anywhere, anyone close to her, we're talking about the most, the very, sure. like the top of the line, most powerful. Well, but these are no slouches. No. These 10 Aes Sedai. They are some of the 10 most powerful Aes Sedai. But each of the Supergirls is more powerful than any one of them. But here's, here's her whisper. Nynaeve said, if we stop them, if we could stop them, he'll die. I do not think I could handle half that much power. She paused as if she had just heard her own words. That she could channel half of what 10 full Aes Sedai did with the Sa'ang Rial. And her voice grew even fainter. Light, help me. I want to. So ten Aes Sedai plus Vorin Sangriol, and she can channel half that power. I don't know, guys. I don't think that's definitive. She said that she wants to, that she can't, she couldn't do half, but she would like to. Mm. She paused as if she had just heard her own words that she could channel half of what ten full Aes Sedai did with the Terangriol. That's what she said to herself, but that doesn't mean that it's a that she could, but that she thought she might be able to. I read that. I don't want to be nitpicky. No, no. I read. I don't. You don't want to be nitpicky. That's what we're here for. Um, I feel like I'm in a minority here. (laughs) Well, I'm just saying that, like, she. I think she has a pretty good sense of how much power she can handle. Yeah, and I. I am really. I'm really interested in the power rating system because I still do not understand. It's like the thing about the series that I understand the least. All I can really see is like what one I said I can do has done at their best not what they can do but what they have done at, at at their best and then you can compare it based on the power rating between that one and another one or like in steps but you, you i feel like i never really get like a good idea of what exactly that means you know what i mean like okay. insofar as like a precise measurement of yeah. what that means and and a lot of it is like well, you can have two people who are the same strength, and one of them can be much better at tennis than the other one. Right. You know, so there's this also skill level difference that com- that has nothing to do with power level. That's true. But at the same time, if you have one guy who can smash 100, you know, 200 mile per hour serves versus like a skinny kid who can barely lob it back over the fence, someone's going to win there. <laughs> skill's not really that important you know if you can play basic tennis that's a good point Aradia. i wonder if it's because they're all in this room healing and Nynaeve is measuring herself against that that how do i say this not that they're like 10 of that five of them are as strong as Nynaeve in raw power but that while they're doing this thing but by comparison because they're so sucky at it by comparison. That they just suck at healing in comparison to Nynaeve? Well, yeah. And, and, you know, I shouldn't say they suck because it's in comparison to Nynaeve. So right, that right, it just, right. you know, it means that they're very good in all probability. It's a relative <laughs> value. Right. But went up against, like, someone that was born to do this. The next thing I have is Elaine convincing Egwene to switch her yeah. alliance. <laughs> I'm just sort of or which brother that she should yeah, like which of her brothers to have a crush on this just sort of is and a disgusting paragraph to me I'm just like Ugh, really Elaine gives her regular like he always does what's right even if it's hurtful to other people or if everyone objects and Egwene says that sounds uncomfortable but not horrid I cannot imagine Gala doing anything horrid because he's pretty <laughs> Elaine shook her head as if in disbelief that Egwene found it so hard to see what was clear to her. If you want to pay attention to someone, try Gawain. He's nice enough, most of the time, and he's besotted with you. Gawain? He's never looked at me twice. Of course not, you fool. The way you stare at Gallad until your eyes are ready to fall out of your face. Which is yep, a good point, you know. Why put yourself, why would Gawain put himself out there? That's just his life, right? He's constantly overshadowed by his more attractive, ridiculously good-looking older brother. But yeah, Elaine in this scene is pretty much just like, yeah, you can marry Gawain, but not Galen. <laughs> like, cool, you can do whatever you want with this brother, but not the other one, because I hate him. In the words of one of the best models of all time, there's more to life than being ridiculously good-looking. <laughs> 
sisters before misters. I never heard that before. <laughs> That's great. Gawain has this sense of loyalty to Galad, and if there's anyone who might be interested in Galad, and he is interested in Elaine. Gawain's interested in Egwene. Galad. <laughs> Aradia says, this is not Game of Thrones. You have to admit, Egwene, Elaine, Galad, Gawain. Oh, yeah. It's tough to force out the right one at the right time. There's only like four unique syllables in all of those <laughs> right. names. <laughs> Damn you, Camelin. Come up with some more <laughs> syllables. That's kind of why I like Egwene more than Egwene. I feel like Egwene and Elaine are too close to rhyming. Where they're, whereas Egwene is I don't a little like it more either. unique. That's why I've always sort of stuck with it and why I have a hard time going back. Yeah, I don't know. We, we are pretty close to Game of Thrones territory. Elaine and Ran do have the same brother. It's true. Even if they aren't directly they're not related. They're technically related. By blood in any way. But they do share a brother. And Rand gets very uncomfortable when he realizes he may be closely related. Which is a pretty funny scene. They do look alike. There's only so many. And if they have to keep marrying each other, I don't think I have to lay this out. It's just the way it works. And then here is where Egwene switches. That is nice to know, Egwene said, then laughed at Elaine's grin. Perhaps I can get him to say some of those things to me instead of to you. And I think at that point she starts flirting with Gawain to try and get him to, like, say that he likes her. So anyway, I think this is the transition point. So keep an eye out for any more comments about brother to brother to brother. It just ended, Eglab. Yeah. And because Egwene is swayable? I mean, I think it's also based on the idea that Jordan had that if she had survived the last battle, she would have ended up back with Galad, And he would have ended up being her true love long term. Yeah. That's my assumption. She just hadn't. She just never survived. But if, if she'd survived Gawain's death, she totally would have ended up with Galad. <laughs> That's a good question, Sir Septon. I I've wondered that myself. I don't know why. I don't know why there are redheads in the Draken line. But also, why not? Yeah, no Ruidian Andorian memories. I think it's just red hair is not a unique thing. Yeah. And I think the Andorran hair is more of a red gold, which indicates a very different genetic line than the dark red. It's more common with the Aiel. The Terran Rial wouldn't work for someone who's not Aiel. They wouldn't get any memories. Why wouldn't any of the any of the people who go through Ruidian see anyone who's related to the Camelin line? So I think the question was, if Rand has both inherited memories... It, he has memories from his mother's line, which is the Camelin royal line, mm -hmm. and the Aiel line, which is his father's line. Why, when he goes through the Terangrial, does he only see the Aiel memories? Gotcha. And I think that, as far as I know, the redstone column Terangrial would not work for anyone who isn't Aiel. They just wouldn't have any memories to access. It appears to only access inherited Aiel memories. I, s I see what you mean. You know, and we see that Avienda is able to tune or key or at least alter the columns to sort of, instead of showing the past, show the future. And I wonder if there's something similar you could do to key them onto only a particular genetic line. Right? Somebody set them up to say, listen, here is the, we want to show you the moment of. Here's what you'll see. Yeah. We want to show you the history of your people, starting from the boar. So the the Gen set that up when they were building building Rudion. Mm -hmm. So my assumption is that they may have done that with the Aes Sedai in order to hold the memories of their people since they knew they were dying. And so that's why I think it's tuned specifically to the genetic memory of the Aiel people, because it's done so by the Gen Aiel. And so I think that Rand... You have to have Aiel genetics to see anything if you go through the columns. Gotcha. And they only show Aiel memories. And yeah, they, and everyone sees the same events, just slightly different points of view based on who exactly they're related to. Oh, yeah. I don't... I think you might be responding to something different than what I was asking. Okay. Not that you could just see the memories of anyone who has red hair and why wouldn't you be able to see the... the or the lineage of the Andorran line, but 
if the Andorran line was related to the Aiel, why wouldn't we see any part of them oh, when we go through sure. the... That's what I was asking. I don't think they are related. Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> so I, wasn't, I was like, oh, yeah, of course they're not related. That's, I'm not even addressing that question. The next thing I have is Nynaeve filling in Elaine on the mission. Egwene tries to dodge the question when Elaine asks what Swan said, what Swan said to them after she sent Elaine out of the room in the last chapter. And we predicted all of this. Of course she would want to know. Of course Swan would know that she would want to know and that the girls would tell her, even if they were forbidden to. So this was all. This, this Swan made this happen. It was totally her plan. And now she even says so later. And... Egwene says, uh, we probably shouldn't say, and I don't know if she's just playing coy or if she's being serious, but the end result is the same. Elaine acts all indignant and says, most people think I get off easier than the others because I'm the daughter heir of Andor. The truth is that if anything, I catch it harder than the rest because I am daughter heir. Neither of you did anything I did not, and if the Emerlin had harsh words for you, she would have had twice as harsh words for me. Now, what did she say? And Nynaeve relents immediately. All right, let's just keep, it th- us bet- we'll keep this between us three. Which, of course, goes back to the title of the chapter, The Three Hunters Three. Yeah. They talk about the Black Aja, mention the Gray Man from the last couple of chapters. Which I didn't realize Elaine wasn't there for. But Yeah, no. Know, she was being beaten. <laughs> yes. Elaine was a little sort of... A bit of explanation for her later rashness. Just the particular sentence, that is the kind of courage expected of the Queen of Andor. It's this status that she feels she has to live up to. And if you read back into that paragraph, it's like, the Queen charged headfirst into an opposing army by herself so that people would rally around her. And I think Elaine even does that later, is pregnant and runs headfirst into the enemies. That may be true. Just to get... And it might be rash... But there's there's a whole school of historians out there that think that people acted differently, say, in like the Civil War when men had an education that was based in like classical Greek and like classical studies. Sure. Because they had these crazy stories to live up to about like Odysseus and, you know, whatever, the founding of Rome and Romulus and Remus and these wild stories. And so they would get into combat and do things that were like seem incredible to us now. But when you're. You believe you're held to those standards, and they're, they're the only standards you know. You'll tend to get closer to them, is the idea. But this isn't very sciencey or factual. It's just what people jump to a lane, think swinging that, a sword at a trollic at eight months pregnant. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> think that perhaps men who were fighting in World War One were braver. Maybe. Meh. There's no um, way to ever prove that. I, I feel like we all have the same chemical emotional responses to stimuli and like you may do something in a slightly different way because of a story but you're still just as terrified oh yeah it doesn't make you less terrified it just affects the the way you respond sure sure where it's like i'd (laughs) i'd be like you can't make me you can't make me charge a (laughs) machine gun are you nuts (laughs) what are you gonna do shoot me at least i'll know that i'm dead right and i'm not gonna die oh yeah well i won't (laughs) What are you going to make me do? Charge a dome of power (laughs) of Ashaman? Charge a machine gun. Get out of here. But Elaine will charge some machine guns, figuratively. Well, you, yeah, some of you do. Me and Patrick do not. (laughs) Um, I also want to note here that the Prince of the Sword is supposed to command the army of Andor. And on the We Hate Gawain train, he should be fucking commanding the army of Andor, not playing his little games in the White Tower with his soldier boys for Elida for this whole freaking series. Anyway, that's my rant on Gawain. Yeah, I always kind of wondered what he was doing there. Elaine has Elaine and I guess Brigida and basically ends up being the first Prince of the Sword because she's the one who's commanding the armies where Gawain should be. Yeah. And frankly, he would have been better off commanding the armies than whatever pining away he was doing over Egwene. For sure. And serving Elida, which right. does no good for anything. Who's been corrupted by Patton Fane on top of all her other horrible flaws. True. I always forget about that connection. 
No, well, Bambi, I don't think it's really arguable. Brigitte did a way better job than Gawain ever yeah. could. <laughs> She's, I mean, she is a hero. It, it's interesting. Gawain is sort of the the one character that shirks his responsibilities. That like that duty is heavier than a mountain thing. Like Gawain just doesn't pick up his mountain. He just lets it sit there. Yeah, and I feel like he he tries very hard to live up to responsibility to res- like imagined responsibilities like he makes up new ones like this leading the younglings thing how does that happen what is he doing why is he doing that he just ends up there and he just like in the most headstrong kind of way just goes with it he's like i have to do this now without ever questioning why he has to do that well i feel like he takes actions based on assumptions that are incorrect that like he's trying yes. to track down Elaine when it's like, we'll just go back to Andor. She's going to turn up and she's going to need you when she turns up there. And then the whole like, yeah. Must fucking, kill Elthor. Yeah. Yeah. The whole killing Rand because he killed my mother when your mother's not even dead. And you, <laughs> and your sister told you that flat out that he had nothing to do with it. I've, I've known many people who procra- procrastinate in a similar way when facing responsibility. They invent another responsibility that they have to do first, but actually can't really be done something more important has come up yes getting drunk <laughs> <laughs> that frequently comes up yes <laughs> i thought it was interesting that while they're talking to elaine right after she's saying that she's not afraid or that she is afraid she's not stupid enough to not be afraid but she won't quit before she starts basically that Nynaeve believes that the amerlin may mean to let matt die i thought that was perceptive of her yeah i think so Again, this is this is chapter is all about Nynaeve being smart to me. I feel like she's being very, very perceptive about what's going on. And of course, Egwene responds all the way here. Varen said that the Amerlin would see that he was healed. Nynaeve shook her head. Varen said the Amerlin would see to him. That is not the same thing. And the Amerlin avoided saying yes or no when I asked her. Maybe she has not made her mind up. But why? Elaine asked. Because the White Tower does what it does for its own reasons. That's a good enough reason. Or, I mean, it's good enough reasoning. She's on the right track. None of the three oaths say they have to heal him. No. They really don't. Right, they can't kill him, but they can do nothing. I can do nothing, too. I'm really good at it. (laughs) Um, I also like that she's very perceptive about, like, we're just tools. And if you break a tool, you just get another one. Yeah. You don't cry, you buy a new one. This is when she takes up her bag of medicines and threatens to just go right to Matt's room and see if she can't just do the thing herself. Right. If they won't, if they won't heal him, well, then I, God darn it, I will. I almost wish I could see that scene. Of her her trying. trying. I honestly think she'd burn herself out trying. Probably. Because it took every drop of power those ten Aes Sedai plus Vora Sangreal were able to muster up. And they were beat and dead and they barely, barely healed him. She couldn't, you know, we we were just talking about the fact that she could only hold, like, half that much power. Yeah. Now, that being said, maybe if she was a little more skilled and she uses all five powers and she knows a little bit more about what she was doing, is there, and as she gets more powerful, is it possible she could have healed them on her own? I think so. Maybe. With a lot more skill and techniques that all these Aes Sedai don't know about. And certainly once she's able to pull Elaine and Egwene into a circle, I mean, the three of them combining their powers are pretty impressive in terms of power scale. Maybe, yeah, at full strength, maybe as powerful as the other ten. That's a good question. Do those three ever link up to form one circle and, like, no. really kick ass? I don't think they ever do. They all, they're all they all so powerful on their own. They just, like, I believe we valuable. see them all in circles but with others. Right. Well, the, the bowl of the winds, sure, but that's neither one of them is driving. I'm thinking of like when one of the three of them is driving, because they, they talk about how it's more valuable to really be able to respond with your own power. And frankly, they're already powerful enough for the most part to take out several other Aes Sedai once they're able to like split their weaves and know how to shield and stuff like that. Sure, there's no real need to link unless they were taking on a Forsaken, and I don't think they ever do that consciously like ishmael or lanfear or mogedian yeah because like Nynaeve would have kicked the crap out of mogedian if she also had elaine's power to pull from or Gwen. yeah 
Because it wasn't it as it is, Nynaeve was just like a hair more powerful or something like that? They were exactly the same. The same. And then Nynaeve threw a bowl in her face, and that right. distracted her enough to... <laughs> Way to think outside of the box, Nynaeve. Yeah. And my headcanon is that's not as strong as Ny- Ny- Nynaeve continues to get stronger after that point, and so that if she were to reconfront Logedian, she would um, totally have kicked her ass no problem. Mm-hmm. Both in terms of skill, but also just in terms of raw power. Sheer overwhelming yeah. force. It probably is a stretch moment for Nynaeve, that moment in sure Terabon. Is that in Terabon? Tanchico. Tanchico. And one of the things is that women tend to have less individual stretching moments and tend to grow more so over time. Whereas the men tend to have these like step function moments where they go from like... You mean big jumps as opposed to lots of little ones? Yeah, or I don't even think the girls have lots of little jumps so much as they just over time... They're a little more powerful today than they were yesterday, and a little more powerful every single time they channel. Yeah, a curve versus a stepwise function. I just have the readout after that. Yeah, the only comment here is that Nynaeve says they don't know how to form a circle. We yeah. don't know how to combine our abilities. And then Elida walks in. We've never tried working together, Nynaeve said slowly. I'm not sure I know how to combine our abilities. Trying could be almost as dangerous as drawing too much of the power. Oh, if we were going to do it, Elaine said, climbing off the bed, let's do it. The longer we talk of it, the more frightened I will become. Matt is in the guest rooms. I do not know which one, but Shiryum told me that much. As if to put a period to her words, the door banged open, and an Aes Sedai entered as though it were her own room, and they were the interlopers. Egwene made her curtsy deep, to hide the dismay on her face. Dun, dun, dun... This is a good, I uh, actually think this is a good Nynaeve character building chapter. Plus it sets the light up as a bad uh, person, the next one. Sort of makes her a, uh, what's the name of the woman in Harry Potter? The woman? Yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> Umbridge, thank you. Or idiot knows what I'm saying. <laughs> Elida's just the worst. I just, every time. That's why she's Umbridge. I see her character, I just think, like, you know, if I was more gay, so I'd be like, listen, I'm stuffy, but could you send me someone who's less stuffy than me? <laughs> like, how do you deal with hanging out with someone like that all the time? I just couldn't... You don't hang out with people like that. You meet them for business meetings. But they stay, they're in the same room all the time. I'd send her back, be like, send me a new one. <laughs> Not, I don't want this one. Come on, Swan. How are you going to send me a red? I mean, Elida campaigned hard to be connected to the royal house in Andor because of the prophecy. She just got connected to the wrong royal house. What are you referring to? Oh, so Elida's interest in inserting herself into Andor comes because she has the foretelling. Uh huh. And one of her foretellings was that the key to the last battle would be the royal house of Andor. So she attached herself to the next Queen of Andor, which was Morghese and her line. The problem was at the time, the Queen of Andor was Tigraine, and her line ended up being Randall Thor. Gotcha. So Elida misinterpreted her foretelling and attached herself to the royal house of Andor, but it was the wrong royal house. Yeah, she does always misinterpret them, but I'm okay with that because I don't like her. No, but, <laughs> but that is one of the main reasons why she ended up as the advisor to the Queen of Andor, is she worked really hard to get there and campaigned hard for it. Yeah, I like the interpretation that she has these foretellings that are about the world at large, and she interprets them as about herself, when she they often have very little to do with her. How telling. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?